back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Let's go to another segment with Vito Echeverria. He's with Cuba Ventures Corp. Vito, welcome back. All right. I know, I look at your, your business card here, and it has a, a lo lovely little color thing of, of Cuba, eight, eight different colors. Does that correspond to anything? What it the, the provinces, uh, Cuba's provinces, basically. That's okay. the breakdown of each province. All righty. So in, in Havana, it would be? Uh, very much to the west. I mean, obviously, a Pinata de Rio, which is west of that, which is a major uh, tobacco cigar-producing area. And these provinces <laughs> date back to when? Uh, well, basically, uh, the birth of the island, basically, birth of the country, uh, if you will. Right. It, go it goes back. If I were to mention OFAC. Yes. I mean, I mean, the question about the colors I thought was interesting. Yeah. Obviously, it bored you. <laughs> I mean, you were bored by that question, obviously. But, you know, a lot of people out there are color <laughs> theorists or artists or painters, or they love Cuba for the culture of it. We have a lot of Spanish speakers around the world <laughs> who watch our show. And let me put that down and move on. Okay. <laughs> so, um, OFAC, what is it? Tell me about it. It stands for the Office of Foreign Assets Control. It's part of the U.S. Treasury Department. It's a department within that branch that enforces trade embargo, not just against Cuba, but any other country that we have an issue with, such as North Korea and Iran, sort of thing. Um, OFAC, at the end of the day, is this governing body which tells American companies and individuals what they can and cannot do with Cuba. Since it is part of the executive branch, uh, it exists under the pleasure of whoever the president happens to be, whether it's Reagan, Bush, Obama, et cetera. So obviously under Obama, because he wanted to relax sanctions with Cuba and bring things down toward the road of getting rid of the embargo altogether, um, OFAC stepped in to say, okay, we're gonna relax certain restrictions. Um, the problem with that is, is that is in the practice, Ob uh, OFAC has sent mixed signals about what, th what that really means. For example, during the Obama administration, OFAC was continuing uh, to, f to, you know, to impose multi-million dollar fines against various foreign banks for doing business with Cuba. We're talking banks from BNP Paribas to Societe Generale, Credit, Credit Suisse, among others. Obviously, the situation with BNP Paribas uh, was the most serious because OFAC, along with the, uh, the Justice Department, actually wanted to impose as much as, a, I believe, $8 billion uh, against that bank, not just for transactions involving Cuba, but transactions involving other countries such as Iran and Syria, among others. Um, obviously, the reason why there's such controversy with Cuba is precisely because Obama's rapprochement policy. The answer to that question, though, as to why this is still happening, is because of the fact that OFAC, because it's a bureaucracy, takes its time in terms of instituting um, fines against a given bank. So, for example, in 2014, when Obama was carrying this uh, pushmont policy, um, the fines were for transactions that predated his administration, basically. So that was the justification for these situations. So the question is right now, what is going to happen under Trump? Is OFAC still going to impose fines against banks based on situations that happened during the latter part of the Obama administration. Right. So Obama loosened it up. Yeah. OFAC was still processing through fines for banks, busting the sanctions from right. previously. And they're still having inventory or a backlog of stuff. Yeah. They're still going through it. And then Trump comes in, and his right. message is then again uh, different again, right? So how does that play? Yeah. You know, right now, the Trump's a very mixed message because, you know, he's toying with the idea of scaling back some of Obama's policies. Um, the speculation right now is that he may scale back as far as telling American companies that they cannot do business with companies that are controlled by the Cuban military. It's a, it's a conglomerate in Cuba known as Gaesa, which, among other things, controls a number of hotels there, which include at least one hotel that's being currently managed by Starwood Hotels, right, actually. So military uh, controls the hotels? Not all, but a good number of the hotels in Cuba are, ma are controlled by the military there, actually because it's the engine of growth for the Cuban economy right now. It's a source of hard currency, dollars, if you will. And, you know, basically, I mean, it helps support the system there. All right, so talk about Starwood, Starwood Hotels, right? They didn't announce a big luxury hotel, right? There's something going on there? What's well, happening? they're they're currently managing three luxury hotels, at least one of which is managed, is actually owned by the Cuban military itself. So the question is, how did that happen? You know, the other question is, how did this happen in the context of the fact that Starwood currently has an outstanding claim against the Cuban government for $50 million. 
you know. Um, so, you know, to this day, Star Wars still hasn't answered the question in terms of how that's been done, but obviously this has to been done with the approval Star of Wars OFAC. Star Wars' $50 million claim goes back to when? Goes back to before the revolution. Pre-revolution, yeah. So yeah, then was Starwood exactly. always called Starwood, or was it part of another hotel conglomerate? Or right, exactly, because you have X number of companies. I, I believe Office Depot is on that list um, through a series of mergers and right. acquisitions, if you will. These companies get title, um, you know, to these claims, if you will. So you see a growing a list such as Coca-Cola. So they, they want to build a big hotel, but they yeah. have this fifty million dollar claim, right? And the military controls the hotel, right? Um, Starwood, you know, well, Starwood does a lot of business in hot zones. Why can't the military sell them some weapons and swap out for that debt? <laughs> you know, give all your hotel guests a gun. You check in, <laughs> you get towels, you get, uh, you know, access to the uh, weight room and yeah. a, 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 a Kalashnikov. Right, but I mean, you know, seriously. They got that whole thing with Russia, right? Well, They're I like mean. Like a physical, AK-47s. <laughs> right, but I mean, obviously, you have the situation where the situation with the claims is crucial to seeing things move forward between the two countries in terms of Congress seriously considering the idea of lifting sanctions against Cuba because that's the real logic behind the embargo to begin with, the fact that Cuba nationalized all American assets there. So once you take that logic away, saying, okay, we settled the claims, this, this, and that. Why do we still have this embargo in place? You know, so you have groups right now, such as Engage Cuba. Engage Cuba right now is a lobby base here in Washington, and they're getting a, a lot of corporate support right now to help push for further trade, further engagement with Cuba, because nowadays when people hear Cuba, they're seeing multi-million dollar signs in terms of potential for a lot of trade, a lot of business happening there. If All right, now, I understand, like, JetBlue and these uh, yeah. airlines, they got, okay, nonstop, let's go to Cuba, uh, and they they uh, increase lines, and they're ready to go, and then six months later or a year later, they're saying, you know what, the traffic's been pretty slow, we're going to cut back on some of these lines, we're not getting the boom that we thought we were going to get, why? Well, yeah, that's a mixed bag. Um, the reports that you've been hearing have to do with certain uh, uh, second-tier airlines, such as Frontier and Spirit. What happened was, when the Department of Transportation allotted flights to Cuba, they gave those um, airlines flights to undesirable uh, destinations such as Camagüey. Right. So where's that on the map? Where's that on the map? <laughs> exactly. Where's that? Right. Um, Where is it? Well, point, you, point you're, dealing, on the map. you're dealing with Central and Eastern Cuba. What color? The green and the and the and the, uh, and the uh, fuchsia. Other, <laughs> There's green and fuchsia. Right, these other Apparently, colors. What is that? Like a big uh, flea-infested uh, cane sugar plantation, or what's going on? No, I mean the, the issue for American travelers is when we think of Cuba, all we know is Havana. That's right. We're, we're not familiar with any other destinations. Like for example, Varadero. Did you see Michael Mann's uh, remake of Miami Vice? Yes, yeah, sure they did. They take that cigarette boat from Miami yeah, sure into did. Havana, and it's got uh, that Irish actor Colin Farrell. Yeah. He's uh, with this babe who's hot, Chinese right. babe. It's like yeah. the hottest Chinese babe in Hollywood, right? Right. And they're like, they're just, just the thought of having a, co a, a, a mojito in Havana gets them so hot and sticky. <laughs> right there on the boat, you're like, wait a minute, you know, yeah. you're going like 120 miles an hour, that's, you're gonna, it's dangerous. You should not keep your clothes on. Right, exactly. I mean, you know, Havana's become a very hot destination for us Americans, but the problem is, the average American travels not educated in terms of the other destinations. For example, you have Varadero, which is Cuba's answer to Cancun, basically. You have a lot of these resort towers there and all that. Um, you have a place in the, in the north central, off the north central coast of uh, Cuba, called Cayo Coco, which has some of the most beautiful beaches uh, anywhere in the Caribbean. But like I said, the average American yeah, because there hasn't been industry that. there in 50, 60, 100 years. There's never been industry there. Right. So it's an ecological paradise. You yes. go on an eco-holiday to Cuba because it, socialism means there hasn't been any production there ever. Yeah, there's no overdevelopment there, uh, no, if you will. There's been no development, thanks <laughs> to the beauty of socialism. It's an eco-paradise. But that's the good thing. The good thing is that um, Cuba's become a destination for these travelers. But, yep. you know, you know, but like I said, basically, you know, there's that tug going back and forth among Trump officials in terms of how to handle Cuba. Because you have to remember, what is Trump's business, or what was his business before he became president? You know, tourism, luxury tourism, yeah. real estate, that sort of thing. And the key reference that I point out to is Cap Canna in Dominican Republic, which is a venture that he built along with local partners there back in the 2000s. Um, right, let, me, let me just jump in for a second. Yeah. We're running out of time, and I know we yeah. wanted to talk about Cuba and Venezuela. Yeah. That's a hot issue. Right. And there's energy issues involved there, and Venezuela's in meltdown. <laughs> Can you talk on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, basically the situation is that, you know, Cuba had a sweetheart deal with Venezuela to uh, provide services, doctors, uh, you know, healthcare professionals, that sort of thing, uh, in return for cheap oil. 
Um, so that was a very good deal for a number of years, but because all the chaos is happening in Caracas right now, the oil, ship, the oil shipments are going down significantly, so the Cuba's finding something having to negotiate with Russia and other suppliers for oil. Um, but for those individuals who are um, advocating uh, engagement with Cuba, if you will, you know, it's going to put a certain pressure on Cuba uh, to be able to negotiate uh, for more deals with the United States and other Western powers, if you will, um, for more development on the island. So, I mean, I think that's a potential positive effect, if you will, on this whole pressure, if you will, over oil. I got an idea for an ad to go visit Cuba. You're in the tourism business. It's like Khrushchev saying, you must visit Cuba. <laughs> Isn't that a good idea? Cold right. War, Cold War babies in the Cold War, you know what I'm talking about. Right. <laughs> uh, what about the banking system in Cuba? Is there a central bank? Oh, of course, there definitely is. Um, the, the situation right now between the United States and Cuba, basically, is that, you know, obviously for the longest time, because of the whole war on terror, if you will, which, you know, had all these powers that were added on to the sanctions program, most American banks have been scared to even touch Cuba. Um, the, the glaring exception to that is a small regional bank in Florida, the Pompano Beach, Florida, actually, called Stonegate Bank. Somehow, some way, those guys managed to convince OFAC to give them a license to do business with the Cuban banking system. So as a result, if you're an American visiting Cuba right now, you can get a Stonegate credit card, you know, MasterCard Visa, uh, for use in Cuba. You know, that's never existed over the years because of the embargo. The reason why you don't have the major banks, such as Wells Fargo and Chase, among others, doing the same thing is that they're scared of the whole compliance regime, if you will, involved right, so in OFAC. I can get, a, I can get a, like a debit card loaded up at this Florida bank right. and go spend it in Cuba, using Cuba without having to get currency change or whatever. It's convenient. It's, What's the name of the bank? Uh, Stonegate Bank. Stonegate Bank. Right. In Florida. <laughs> exactly. Are um, they kosher? Are they above board? Or it's not some kind of wacky, uh, you know, Miami Vice type thing, is it? No, that's the whole point. The whole point is um, Stonegate Bank you know, got the approval from OFAC to do business with Cuba in the first place. And, I mean, obviously, if Stone had a fishy history, that wouldn't happen. All right, so they're, 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 we'll, we'll say that they're... Above board. They're, they're okay. Above board. All right, well, Vito, we got to go. All Thanks right. for being on the Kaiser Report. Got it. All right. Pleasure. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report. With me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey here, we'd like to thank our guest, Vito Echeverria. He's from Cuba Ventures Corp. If you want to reach us on Twitter, it's Kaiser Report. Until next time, hasta la vista, baby.